everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. Hi to everyone online. Thanks for joining us online. Why don't we go ahead, stand on up together, and we'll get started with worship this morning. Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, graces waiting. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is free.
Hey, good morning. Oh, good morning. So glad you guys are here. You can have a seat. You uh, braved the rainy weather and you made it out this morning. If you're a regular attender, we're so glad you're here. If you're a newbie, this is a spiritual speakeasy. You don't know it's here, but when a friend invites you, it's pretty awesome. So we're glad that you're here. If you're watching online, we're especially glad you're here as well. Give us a little, a little hello, a little wave. Let us know where you're worshiping from. So, uh, yeah, I just want to give it up for our worship team this morning. Come on. Yeah. Lexi is killing it with this, uh, this staff position as a worship leader. So we're glad you're here. Hey, a couple things going on uh, at Next Chapter. I can't believe it. We are, like, in the summer. All right, here we are. Vacation Bible School. Yes, I love this. July 20th through 22nd. It's sneaking up. It's in the afternoon between 1 and 3 p.m., and it's for kids age 3-year-old through 5th grade. So if you have one of those children, or if you have a neighbor or a family member or a friend who has someone in that age group, uh, this is not just for people in our faith community here. It's a great a uh, great way to invite family and friends to come in and have a, a summer experience where your kids get to have fun and learn more about Jesus. So you can sign up right now. It's not too late. And uh, you can do that on the app or online. And if you want to volunteer, I know Maddie is looking for volunteers in several different areas. So you can connect with her uh, on the website. Her email is there. It's just maddie at the next chapter church.com. So make sure you register. Let us know you're going to show up. Moving up Sunday, another kid's announcement. Oh, this is exciting. July 18th. It's next, oh, that's next Sunday. Next Sunday, there's going to be a big transition for kids who are going to be moving up to the next area. So Sprouts, who enter kindergarten this fall, will move to the K2 room in the Ville. And kids entering third grade will move to Route 35. And kids, this is a big one, entering sixth grade will move to Next Gen. So it's a big transition. Yeah, I heard someone. Woohoo! Who said that? Yeah, it's exciting. Alan, that was you. You're not even a next gen person, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. You can join them. Yeah, dive on in there. I love it, man. Uh, it's awesome. Cool. So yeah, moving up Sunday, and then oh, one more announcement. Uh, Destiny Women's Bible Study is happening tomorrow. Tomorrow it's happening. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn more about Jesus through Scripture, but also like fellowship and hangout. Uh, women of all different ages, this time instead of meeting in the office or the Nexus space, they're going to be meeting at McKenzie River Restaurant, so off campus. Let us know, let them know today at the Get Connected booth or on your app, your newly updated app, if you're going to be there so they can, uh, they can know how many people to reserve a spot for. So, so glad you guys are here this morning. It's a little different. Rob Roy is on vacation. I'm sure he's watching from Florida right now. Hi, Rob. It's good to see you. So uh, Rob's on vacation. I have an opportunity to share, and, and uh, Lexi's leading. So so glad you guys are here. Let's pray. One of the ways so that we worship is through our offerings, because we know God owns it all anyway. Generosity is a key characteristic of who he is. So when we get to mirror that and give back, it's a, a beautiful representation of his heart. Father God, we thank you for your goodness in our lives. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that's new every morning. 
And as we sing more songs this morning, as we learn, not just learn about you, but we know you as, as a person in our lives this morning, we ask that uh, your Holy Spirit would just tug at our hearts. And as we recognize the power of money in our lives and resources in our lives, we ask that you would help us to remove the unhealthy claws that money sometimes has in our hearts as we become generous. And we're grateful for that and what a gift it is to be generous. We thank you for goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand back up together. All right, we're going to worship again with the song we've been doing for the last couple weeks. Um, we're just going to sing this chorus together, okay? This is the day. Here we go. This is the day that you have made. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I will rejoice and be glad in
Father God, we pray that today you give us the strength and the wisdom and the courage to keep you with us and to love you as much as we can and to put all of our love for you into everything we do. Let us be courageous because of your love. Let us be brave because of your love. And let us live because you let us live. Because you died for us, we get to live as strongly as we can for you. We thank you that you let us do all of this in your name as we worship you now, tomorrow, and for all of eternity. We thank you for being such a great and loving God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, if any next-gen people are in here, uh, any of the young, young adults, you can go. There's Lexi waving her hand. There's Sherry waving her hand. You can go with them. They're going to meet in the office or the Nexus space and hang out. So give it up for Lexi again. I love how she leads worship. It's great. All right. Well, how are you guys doing? You good? You good? All right. How many of you have a closet in your house or like an entire basement full of junk? Yes. Oh, overwhelmingly, the rest of you who aren't waving your hands, you're lying. Um, yes. Uh, so we moved into our house five years ago, and we moved into our house three days before our baby was born. So we had never finished unpacking, and just a few weekends ago, we had a yard sale. And I believe Karen and I are kind of moving out of the baby stage, and it's interesting how many, like, plastic toys and, like, riding equipment and, like, walkers and stuff, and our entire basement was covered in that. I had kind of this internal competition uh, between me selling some of my personal stuff, Karen selling some of her personal stuff, or selling baby stuff. I wanted to see who could make the most money, right? But uh, guess who made the most money at the yard sale? There they are, and yes. Yeah, yeah. Those two adorable, adorable kids with their sugary lemonade made so much money. And it's because William, the three-year-old, would ask people as they came up to buy something, do you want lemonade? And they'd say no. And 30 seconds later, he'd say, would you like lemonade? And they'd say no. 
And then 30 seconds later, without buying anything from daddy or mommy, he'd say, do you want some lemonade? And they'd say, yeah, keep the change, right? So they made like over 20 bucks in sugary lemonade, and they're going to spend it on like cars and Legos and stuff. But as I've been looking at all oh, the C-R-A-P, because I have to spell it around my house with my two little ones, because they <laughs> copy what I say, that we have in our home, I'm reminded of what we saw in the video. We have built-in obsolescence. Everything that we take into our home has this expiration date. How many of you have bought a laptop? It's supposed to last 10 years, and then like two years into it, it slows down. You know what I'm talking about. You got to buy the software updates, and then before you know it, you buy a new laptop. That Dyson vacuum cleaner that was 300 bucks that I tried to unload for $10, $10 at the yard sale, nobody wanted, but they wanted the lemonade, right? So it's true. As I've been thinking about that, I'm thinking that we have an expiration date. We have a finite life here on earth, right? We have an expiration date, and we have this limited time, if we're lucky, like 75, 80 years to make an impact. What are we building with our lives? What are we spending our time doing is it worthwhile? These are, these are tough questions that we're going to talk about this morning. Building blocks. Because the truth is we're all building something, right? We're all building something. Like it or not, every day is a new brick. We're slabbing some mortar on there and we're building something. What are we building? Are we using the right building blocks? So we're going to talk about three simple things. I'm not a complicated guy. Three simple things that we can, can do this morning, three simple building blocks to ensure that everything we do, every decision we make in our lives will be for God's glory, for our good, and for legacy. God's glory, for our good, and legacy. Is that cool? Is that cool with you guys? Yeah, all right. Well, I guess not. But Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you are the master craftsman, that you are the master builder. And we ask this morning that you would soften our hearts to what you want to say and that you would give wisdom, wisdom to me as I speak and to look past my humanity and see the truth of your scripture and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Leaning Tower of Pisa. How many of you have actually visited the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Anyone? No, my wife got to when she was in college. Pretty crazy. So this was, uh, this was supposed to fall over in 1990, right? So I can't believe like 30 years ago it was supposed to fall over. And all of the scientists were projecting that when it hit like 5.4 degrees, it would just fall over. And keep in mind, this is like 150 feet tall, right? 150 feet tall. It's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in 1990, it was past 5.4 degrees. It was five and a half degrees. So people were like, hey, we got to keep those American tourists from like going up to the top because they're going to fall over. So they shut the attraction down. And over the next 10 years, they, uh, they did a couple different things to try to secure it from falling over. They eventually discovered that when they dug into the ground and created a hole in the soil, it would tip the other direction. So it's finally good for like another 300 years. But do you guys know? Do you guys know why it's leaning? Do you know? Any of you? Shout it out. <gasps> foundation. The foundation is only 10 feet deep. It's 10 feet deep, right? What were they thinking? 10 feet deep, and it's 150 feet tall. Not just that, but Pisa in ancient Greek means marshy, sandy ground. Hmm. So what I, what I love about this, it's a physical metaphor for what can happen in our lives, right? So the first building block we're going to talk about this morning is foundation, emotionally mentally and spiritually, if we don't have the right foundation, we're going to be in a leaning tower of Pisa situation. And I love this because Scripture is really, really clear on this. And I'm just, you know, we're people of faith, so we're just going to talk about it, right? A foundation, what are you building on? A firm foundation comes from two things. The first one is believing in Jesus, who he said he was, listening to what he said, and doing it. The first step in building a strong foundation is believing in who Jesus said he was, listening to what he said, and then obeying or doing it. And I love this, uh, this out of Luke. This is Jesus speaking. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, 
listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the flood waters rise and break against the house, because you know it's going to happen. Storms are going to come. Flood waters are going to rise. It stands firm because it's well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground, on sandy ground, without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against the house, it will collapse into a heap of ruin. So first of all, trusting Jesus, listening to him, and obeying him. And Jesus, the Son of God, says that this is the firm foundation. And also, second, second part of the firm foundation comes from the fear of the Lord. How many of you grew up in a tradition where you heard that phrase, fear of the Lord, right? Yeah. And it's a, it's a complicated phrase because it's been around in Christendom for quite, quite some time. And I think it's, it's uh, in many cases created this like shaky knees, like terror situation. But if you look at the translation, it means an awe, a reverence of Almighty God, and awe and reverence. Yes, He is a powerful God. Yes, there are aspects of His, His wrath and His strength and His power, but this fear of the Lord is a reverence for who He is, recognizing that He is Creator, and we are the created. So yes, the second step is a fear of the Lord. And Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of knowledge. Foundation. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. This does not mean being afraid of God. So before we build anything, that first block is foundation. I love this cornerstone principle. We sing this song. Christ alone cornerstone. And this is an architectural term that's been around for a long time before people would build an entire building like stonemasons would build. They would take that first stone, that cornerstone for the foundation. And it had to be perfectly level, perfectly horizontal and perpendicular and ready to go because everything would build upon that outward and upward outward and upward. And that's why through Scripture you see that Jesus is the cornerstone. That's why we sing about it. He is the cornerstone. If we build a strong foundation on Him, if He's the plumb line for every decision that we make, that's the best start for building something that will last beyond ourselves for God's glory and for our good. Because the truth is, if you don't build on that cornerstone, Everything is going to fall like a house of cards. That first time that that storm hits, it will fall like a house of cards. I love what Jonathan Evans says. What delineates the wise person from the fool makes itself evident when the true storms of life shows up. What we build on determines everything because the storms will happen. So foundation, before we look at that second building block, let's take a look at this video. At first glance, it could be mistaken for an amusement park. In Anatolia, a four-hour drive away from Istanbul, 700 Renaissance-style villas line the mountains. In the space of just a few months, this unusual residential site has become a ghost town, as well as a symbol of Turkey's current real estate crisis. Our project is inspired by the world of fairy tales. Our architecture borrows from Disneyland, but also from French and Turkish castles, and all this in a natural scenery. When it will be finished, there will be three lakes, several leisure centers, and a golf club. The project was launched in 2014, and initially, it sparked curiosity. This is a display villa, with a large living room and an open kitchen. The houses were put on sale for 400,000 euros each, and 300 of them were quickly acquired, many by clients from Gulf countries, who were attracted, according to this real estate agent, by the promise of a dream lifestyle. The highlight is this terrace. It's our client's favorite part. But the fairy tale soon turned into a nightmare. Because of the real estate crisis in Turkey, the company went bankrupt. 
We were no longer able to sell, and so we lacked the funds to pay off our debt. So in order to save the project, we had to put it under state protection. He says he's convinced that brighter days lie ahead. The first tenants are expected by the end of next summer. But the construction works are at a stall and a lack of maintenance means some of the houses are damaged. These properties have become the symbol of a deep real estate crisis in Turkey. Crazy. Location, location, location. Right? Wrong place. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong time. I hear that all the time. My dad's been in real estate for a long time. Location, location, location. So yeah, after we build on the foundation of Christ and the fear of the Lord, location, what does that mean? Are we being obedient to where and when in time and space God wants us to do things? Are we being obedient in time and space when God wants wants us to do things. When and where are we building? When we do things in our own timing, our, our own prompting, either we go completely rogue or we shrink back and do nothing. How many of you have shrunk back and done nothing when you feel like God's prompted you to do something? It's okay, there's no shame there. Yeah, I've done that too. How many of you have gone like rogue and be like, I'm just gonna do this, yeah? Made decisions and later on you're like, oh, that was not a good idea, yeah? So just... The uh, constant listening to the Holy Spirit in time and place to do things. Is it the right time? Is it the right place? Because there have been so many things that have been done with a certain amount of passion or apprehension that have not been God's will and purpose. I love and kind of get confused by Old Testament stories. How many of you know the story of the Israelites wandering in the desert? Yes? Yeah? Okay. So... Um, in typical Charlton Heston style, uh, yeah, God delivered the Israelites from Pharaoh. They were leaving Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, and God was moving them toward the promised land, right? They got to the promised land, and God said, this is where, this is where you need to be. This is the location. This is the time. I'm empowering you as my people, the Israelites, to take over this city, this land of Canaan. And you're going to take over, and it's going to be okay. So Moses sent 12, tri uh, 12 spies into the land of Canaan, all right? So 12 spies went in, 12 spies came out, and 10 of the spies are like, there is no way that we will be able to take the land of Canaan. And keep this in mind. This is what's crazy. Like, there were, uh, according to like ancient Hebrew scriptures, 600,000 men in the Israelite nation, right? And they only counted the men, so that meant there were like over 2 million Israelites, and God trusted each and every person there to be led by Moses. Moses tr trusted the spies. Ten people came back and said, there's no way we can do it. And only two spies said, yes, this is the time, this is the place, this is the location, the building block that God wants us to do to step into his goodness, Joshua and Caleb. And because of their lack of faith in God's timing, because of their lack of trust, God said, okay, I mean, this is a bummer. You could go in there right now, but... The journey that would have taken 11 days to get to the promised land took 40 years. This was their roadmap. Look at this. 40, yeah. Wandering around. 40 years. It would have taken 11 days because they decided not to listen and obey and step into God's location. Building with a foundation and then a location. I know that's kind of like a broad brush stroke of, of how God communicates sometimes and not that we can apply all these Old Testament passages to our lives now, but I think it kind of speaks to the character of God. There are times in my life when I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, talk to this person. And I'm like, I don't feel like it. You know, or, or like, hey, um, you, you need to like, you need to consider changing this part of your life, and you should do it now. And I'm like, I, I don't really want to. I'm kind of comfortable. So how many, come on, be honest. How many of you felt that way? Yeah, all right. And, and it just happened to me as I was doing like message prep, all right? I was getting ready here, and I was like, well, first of all, if people are going to listen to me, I got to get a haircut, right? Because nobody's going to listen to me if I'm not clean shaven. So I went to get a haircut. Normally when I get a haircut, I'm like, just, just cut my hair. Like, I don't really want to talk to you. I know it's so egocentric. I'm like, I don't really want to talk. Just cut my hair. Just kind of be here. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying, hey, why don't you uh, ask some questions of the person cutting your hair? I'm like, well, I'm not Rob Roy, so 
I, I'm not gregarious, and I'm kind of uncomfortable with it. I'm like introspective. But the more like I decided to step out in obedience and ask questions, the lady who was cutting my hair started opening up about her kids, about her failed marriage, and there were two spots where she started to tear up and get emotional. And I'm like, how self-centered was I in deciding to like not talk to her? I decided to step out in God's timing, at, at the time he wanted to, with the person at that time, and actually have an a point, a opportunity of connection that could have not been there. So, yeah, it doesn't need to be like a wandering around the desert or the wilderness for 40 years thing. It can be very practical every day, listening to the Holy Spirit to speak to someone or to do something in his timing. We either go rogue or we shrink back. The best intentions mixed with the fiercest passion can't compare with the everyday listening to the Holy Spirit and being obedient. I love the old song, Trust and Obey. How many of you kind of grew up with that? Yeah, some of us? Yeah. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And uh, yeah, it's true. Like every day to trust and obey in proximity to time and space with what he wants us to do. Amish barn raising. Yes. This was, I know, I jump around a lot. I like pictures up there. But, you know, you're pacing. Are you pacing with me? Yeah. Amish barn raising. Okay, so back in the 18th and 19th centuries, this was super, super popular in Ohio and in Indiana and in Pennsylvania. And it's crazy. I was just watching some videos about this. So what would normally take months for one farmer and his family to build a barn they can get done in one day, right? One day, 11 hours. If you look it up on YouTube, there's like a three-minute time lapse where you can watch them build an entire barn in three minutes, 11 hours. And I love this because they're all moving towards the same purpose, towards the same goal. There's a community, a common unity, a community, a common unity for what they're trying to do. And everybody has their role. The older Amish guys are like overseeing, telling the younger muscle guys what to do with power tools in a typical gender fashion for them. The women are bringing food and water and the, the kids are grabbing supplies and everybody has a role and they get it done in 11 hours. And I'm thinking about common unity. I'm thinking about community. So we have foundation, location, and coalition. Foundation, location, and coalition. Who are we, who are you doing life with? Who are you building with? Are they building the same thing? Are they using the same bricks and mortar? I, th I think about a time in my life, in my mid-20s, where I kind of like looked around at some of my friends. I'm like, these, these people don't want the same thing. Like, they just don't. That's okay. There's a difference between friendship and community. Friendship, which God calls us to be loving, connected with people, and community, people with a common unity. And sometimes there are those decisions that we have to make. Like, are these people people I should be in community? Do they have the same foundation, the same desire to listen to the Holy Spirit? And are they part of a coalition or a community that's moving me closer to the heart of God, who are we building with? Who's in our collective? Who's in our coalition? It's true. We become the people we spend time with. We become the people we spend time with. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Are there people that we, that you are spending time with that aren't using the same bricks and mortar? They aren't building the same thing. I love this. I heard, uh, I heard a speaker a few years back and it stuck with me. And just because I like share a story or a quote from somebody doesn't mean like I completely agree with all, every part of their theology. But so like uh, T.D. Jakes, T.D. Jakes, He's a great storyteller, all right? So he was talking about chickens and eagles. 
Anybody heard this before? Oh, okay, all right. So a little fresh and new. All right, so I can like, I can lay it on pretty thick. It'll be fun. All right. So chickens and eagles. They're both birds, right? Both birds. All right. Chickens. This is fascinating. They try to fly, right? And they get like three feet up in the ground and they just come right back down. They're always looking down, right? They're always looking down. This is crazy. They eat their own feces. Yeah, it's disgusting. I know. It's a PG-13 message today. They eat their own feces. But eagles... On the other hand, birds as well. Birds as well, but a completely different coalition, all right? Nine-foot wingspan. When they see a storm, what do they do? They fly into the storm. They fly into the storm. This is crazy. I said it was a PG-13 message. They are intimate in the air as they fly. They mate in the air. How is that possible? Um, Fascinating. It's so true, all right? You can't expect to behave like the eagle God has created you to be if you're only around chickens all the time. Can I get an amen? I know, I know, right? I know, I'm not T.D. Jakes, but you can't expect to behave like the eagle who God has created you to be if you're only chilling with the chickens all the time, because that's going to rub off on you. We become the people we spend time with. And once again, just an aside, there's this huge difference between friendship and community. Common unity. God calls us to be in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. To be surrounded and loving and friends with everyone, but that common unity. Even Jesus displayed this. He had all of these people following him in hordes, and then he had his 12 disciples, part of his smaller circle. And then aside from that, he had three people he was very close to, part of his community, his common unity. Foundation, location, and coalition. Those three things. Are your friends obsessed with temporary happiness? Or do they have an eternal perspective? Are your friends bitter and negative? Or are they hopeful and positive? I love Legos. All right, I do. I told you I jump around a lot. Amish building and then Legos. I love Legos. So I, uh, I've loved them for a long time. How many, of you, how many of you got to see the art of the brick that was at the Museum Center a few years ago. Come on. Oh, okay, I'm the only nerd in here. Okay, how many of you love Legos? All right, yeah? I have some on my desk right now. Did you know that they make Legos for adults? They do. They're like architectural Legos. I've got like, uh, yeah, it's, it's nerdy. You can go and see them in there. But this, this is uh, Nathan Sawaya. He was, uh, he's a professional Lego builder, right? He used to be an attorney in New York, and he's like, forget that. I'm going to build with some bricks. And now he travels around. He does uh, specific installments of of art. And I love this because my five-year-old Harrison is just now getting into Legos. And it's the big boy Legos. And it's so exciting because... I find myself as he's building, like, like wanting to grab and like start to build myself. But like he can follow these multi-point steps. Like he can go from step one to thirty, and he can do most of it himself. He has the finger dexterity, he has the attention, he has the ability to follow directions, and it's amazing because it's like rekindling some excitement in me from childhood. But so when we build. Sometimes I'll get the parts out and he'll put them together and we follow these steps. But there are times when he's building and he, he sometimes jumps from one, two, three, four, and jumps from step four over to seven. And I'm like, oh. and every bit of me like has to stop from grabbing the Legos and like doing it for him. But like I just kind of hover in the back and I calmly say, hey, you can't, you know, you can't skip that step. You got to go here because I know where it's headed. I've got the, we've got the blueprint. We know what's being built. We know the perfect picture of what's being built. And it reminds me of the heart of our Father God. He loves us so much that He lets us partner with Him in building, in building our lives with the foundation, the location, and the coalition. And He is gentleman enough and a loving father enough that he will hover, 
His presence will be right there. He'll whisper into our ears, but he will not, most of the time, grab the Legos from us and start building himself. He lets us partner in that building. And it reminds me to listen to that still, small voice of a loving father as he says, should you really do that here right now? Should you really connect with these people in this way? Should you really do this or do that? And it's that loving heart of God because he knows the beautiful picture at the end. He has this massive architectural plan for humanity. And he has the best plan for his glory and for our good and ultimately for our joy. We have to trust the architect. I love what Proverbs 16, 9 says. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. God is watching. He's patient. He's loving and he's whispering into our ear constantly. Before kids, I talk about this because it was a unique time in, in, in life for Karen and I. We got to, uh, to travel a bit and we got to see the Notre Dame Cathedral. And I'm going to say it in Kentucky speak, Notre Dame. Whatever, Notre Dame Cathedral. And uh, it was amazing. It was a mix of a spiritual experience, a museum experience. This is, it doesn't do any justice, this picture that I took. It was kind of like they were doing a worship service in the middle of us walking around and looking at many different architectural things and reading about some of the deceased followers of Christ who were buried in the floor right there. And I still have like a little candle in my office. When you look at the Legos later in my office, you can see a little candle from Notre Dame that's in there. It was amazing. It was, it was gorgeous. It was beautiful. It's something I can't explain with words. And it was built over the course of 200 years. 200 years. And we were there at the anniversary of the 850th year. It was there for 850 years. That's like over three times the length of our nation. Like our nation's not even been around that long. We're a tiny little infant country. Been around for 850 years. And here's what's crazy, right? So in 2019, I'm watching the news, you're watching the news, and Notre Dame is on fire. It is burning. And what took 200 years to build, what lasted for 850 years, in a matter of hours, was crumbling to the ground, and my heart sank. And there are debates, and I'm not going to even talk about that, about like should it be rebuilt or not rebuilt. And here's, here's what I'm reminded of. I think many of us in this room have laboriously and patiently built things with our lives. We've taken time. We've done it diligently. And either something has happened to us in an instant, or we've made a bad decision in an instant and everything that we have built has crumbled to the ground. I think we see pockets of that sometimes. I just want to say this. There is no debate in the heart of God as to if you are worth restoring. There is no debate. You are so worth it. You are priceless. And He will not hesitate to step in and rebuild the beautiful thing in your life that's been destroyed either by you or by other people. I love this. When Jesus was talked about in his growing up years, he was raised by Joseph. He was a carpenter. And actually, if you look at the interpretation of that, that word, it means builder. And if you look at what happened in Nazareth at the time, he would have spent probably less than 20% of his time building with wood and the rest of his time as a stonemason. Jesus, the stonemason. And when you put that lens on, as we sing about Jesus being that cornerstone, that firm foundation, what a beautiful picture of God in the flesh. Here, building buildings with stone, but still today, restoring lives. Still restoring lives. 
No matter the damage that you felt, no matter the damage that you've created in your life, you are never beyond reconstruction. So here's our, here's our question for the day, all right? So for those of you who have uh, stepped into understanding Jesus and that relationship as a foundation, awesome. For those of you who have never stepped into understanding Jesus as that foundation, that cornerstone, I invite you to you know, come and talk to me afterwards or talk to someone on stage who seems like they love Jesus, and they will move you in that direction. Coalition. How many of us need to say, hey, am I spending time in my close community with people who are bringing me away from God's ideal or pushing me towards closer to God's ideal for humanity. And this is a big one for those of us who might have been like Jesus followers for a long time. Are we listening to the Holy Spirit about the location and time and space where He wants us to be obedient and do the things that the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do? All right, worship team, you guys can can come on up. Do we trust the master architect? Do we believe that he can restore anything that's been crumbling to the ground over time, whether done to us or whether we've done to ourselves? We're going to sing, I love the song, Cornerstone. We're going to sing that song. It's become this anthemic song over the past several years for church. And as we sing this, I just encourage you to think about those three things, foundation, location, and coalition. And if we need to freshly dedicate ourselves to leaning on that cornerstone of Jesus, let's uh, let's do that together. Let's go and stand up. Let's pray. Father God, help us to be open and receptive to how you want to speak to our hearts and our minds right now. And for those of us who need to take uh, the next step or to say the next yes to you, I ask you to help us to do that. For those of us who have been building something with the wrong bricks, with the wrong mortar, or we are clearly sinking in the sand, I ask that you would Extend your arm of grace and help us to have the resilience to grab your hand as you pull us you pull us out of that sand. For those of us who feel torn down, for those of us who have felt like something has been introduced to our lives that has burnt something to the ground, whether relationships or practical familial things in our lives, we just... We thank you that you are the God in the business of restoration and continual building. And we say yes to that restoration. Even if it doesn't look as we expected it, we know that you can constantly repair, and not just repair our heart, but that you can transplant our heart and put a new one inside of us. Father God, reveal your grace and truth. Father God, we surrender to your plans in what you're building. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience to seek us out, to restore us, and to still be our cornerstone. And Holy Spirit, we want to listen to your whisper right now, your voice that guides us, that guides us with the timing of your plans and your purposes, with foundation, location, direction, and wisdom. We thank you, Jesus, for all you are. Amen. Let's sing that song together.
trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone For this stand before the Father God, we thank you again for being our firm foundation, the cornerstone that we can lean heavily on as we make decisions, as we build with the bricks and mortar that you've trusted us with the short, finite time we have here. Give us the wisdom, the strength, the discernment to build where and with whom what you want us to build. And remind us as we leave that you love us with a love that we can't comprehend. A love that is in the business of restoration and rebuilding. And let us trust you as the master architect who understands the beautiful narrative picture that you have for what you're building in humanity. We love you, God. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the activity, the current activity of your Holy Spirit in our lives right now. Amen. Amen. All right, be blessed. We'll see you guys next Sunday.